Good evening, one and all present here. I'm Nujat Taslim. I'm a law student, and I welcome you all in the webinar on International Tribunal and Situation in Middle East, organized by Tim Licit Elit. Tim Licit Elit focuses on providing assistance to law students in self grooming while acquiring better knowledge by generating an exclusive learning platform through activities like law classes, blog posts, mooting propositions, uh, drafting competitions, etc. It also aims to connect with legal experts to design better learning opportunities. It provides lecture series of a subject which is accessible to design better learning opportunities, is accessible for free at its YouTube channel. Further on request, it also provides relevant notes in the form of PowerPoint presentations as well as documents or PDF. Lizit Elite provides one on one digital coaching to law students through video conferencing on the request of the students. Goal of the organization is the ultimate welfare of the students as they are the hope of tomorrow. Lizit Elite invites invest in future and assist you in practicing your foremost expertise. International courts are formed by treaties between nation, nations or under the authority of an international organization, such as United Nations, and include ad hoc tribunals and permanent institutions, but exclude any court arising purely under um, national authority. To throw further light on the topic, we have with us Ms. Sasha Mutter. Ma'am has completed throughout her uh, studying years in law school, extensive training in international law and criminal law. She visited the international tribunals in, in Hay and learned about their mechanism and jurisdictions. She has participated and organized several uh, moot, international moot courts, for example, Price Media Law Moot Court, University of Oxford, and so on. While being a conflict resolution coach, her aim is to spread the necessary awareness to educate people on their basic rights. She is an active member in her society where politics is the main topic of discussion whenever two persons meet. Her unbiased opinion and her ability to look into the situation from an observer's point of view have helped her gain credibility of her and among her peers. By this, she is contributing into creating effective and peaceful conflict resolution solutions and spreading awareness on how to manage the conflict where there is no way out of it in her home country, Lebanon and the Middle East region. Now, I would like to welcome you, ma'am, and I would re request you to take the session forward and enlighten us all. Thank you. So as you have seen in the beginning, uh, we, we're going to discuss, those are the topics that we're going to discuss uh, during the session. And I have moved from this to um, giving you here some example of the international courts available at the moment or that have stopped working. Uh, and also, while listing these international tribunals, uh, I'm going to give you some historical background about these uh, tribunals and then move forward to explain why they are called international, when, as you can see in front of you, and they have a limited scope of jurisdiction, geographically speaking. Some are, uh, or some are only, um, some have only limited jurisdiction in Europe and others in the Caribbean and so on. So uh, we're going to start first of all with the European Court of Justice, the ECJ, uh, that has um, a limited uh, scope of jurisdiction in the in Europe and is authorized to interpret the European law. And uh, then there's the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, the ITLOS, that has a global jurisdiction when it comes to maritime conflicts. And um, then there's the Caribbean Court of Justice, the, uh, that has a jurisdiction over general conflicts in the Caribbean region. Uh, and not all the Caribbean countries in the Caribbean region have uh, acknowledged this court when it comes to the appellate, because this court has mainly two jurisdictions, an original one and an appellate one. So uh, when, there are case, when there are countries that do not acknowledge uh, and uh, like accept this court as an appeal court, they revert back to another court uh, within their area. 
Moving from that, we have the International Court of Justice, or otherwise called the World Court. Uh, the World Court is the uh, is currently residing at the Hague, and is uh, and deals with general conflicts when it comes to uh, solving disputes among the state countries that are part of the UN Charter. So it has limited jurisdiction only to the state parties of the UN Charter. Now, it's important to highlight here that the ICJ is the successor of the Permanent Court of International Justice that was established back in, back in the time by the League of Nations. And the, uh, the Permanent Court of International Justice and the League of Nations were uh, consequently um, succeeded by the ICJ and the United Nations. This is to say that the ICJ is uh, established by the UN and is basically the main judicial organ uh, of the UN. Now, moving from this, uh, what does it mean that the International Court of Justice deals with general conflicts? General conflicts, it, uh, such as the legal disputes, that arise between states in accordance with international law. And as I have highlighted before, only state members of the UN are authorized to bring proceedings before the state. However, the statute of the court, which is the UN Charter, regulates in another article the access of the state non-parties of the court statutes and they are authorized to bring their proceedings in front of uh, the court by after the authorization of the uh, Security Council, the UN Security Council. Now before talking about the International Criminal Court, I'm going to uh, tell you and give you a brief historical background about the international military tribunals that are not operational anymore at the moment. Um, the international military tribunals, as you can see, I have not put any scope of jurisdi ju jurisdiction for them because they were two, one based in Nuremberg and another one based in the Far East, which is the Tokyo Tribunal. The Nuremberg Tribunal and the Tokyo Tribunal were established after World War II by the Allied forces under the international law to prosecute the Nuremberg one was established to prosecute uh, members of the Nazi Germany who were responsible for the Holocaust back then. And the International Military Tribunal of the Far East, based in Tokyo, was established to prosecute uh, Japanese leaders responsible for war crimes. These two tribunals created an essential uh, developing point in criminal law because they were the first initiator of the idea to create an international cr criminal court and a permanent criminal court. It was not established, this court was not, was not established until 20, uh, 2002. So it took a long time to finally accept the importance of presence of an international and permanent criminal court that uh, prosecutes basically uh, war crimes, crimes of oppression, crimes against humanity, genocides, and so on. But these are the most important ones that the ICC prosecutes. Even though it has a global scope of jurisdiction, however, the ICC cannot prosecute any individual, and I'm saying individual because the ICC prosecute individ prosecutes individual and not states or organization, uh, um, so the ICC uh, prosecutes individuals, only nationalists of state that states that have ratified the Rome Statute. That is the charter that established this criminal court. So the International Criminal Court prosecutes criminals and not states or organizations. Basically, not moral persons. And moving from there, we have the Special Tribunal of Lebanon, which is the latest uh, international court that was established and is still operational. But the international military tribunals were then uh, 
succeeded by the ICC that is still operational and also resides in the Hague. So as you can see here, the scope of jurisdiction is geographically limited. However, we still call them international uh, tribunals. Why is that? We call them international tribunals because, first of all, as Nushat uh, mentioned in the introduction, they are formed by treaties. And when tribunals are formed by treaties, it means there's a written agreement between states or between a state and, inter and an international organization. These tribunals, these international tribunals more specifically, operate under the authority of an international organization. So they, uh, they, their, uh, their work is entered into force by actors of international law. And who is the actor of international law? Basically, it's international organizations and the states, sovereign states. This is important to note that not any state can uh, enter such uh, tribunal into action, but sovereign states. So moving from this fact, we're gonna discuss the types of the international tribunals. Um, so, so far we have talked about, we have spoken about the definition of an international tribunal, a historical background of the international tribunals, and then the types of international tri tribunals available at the moment. We have the International Court of Justice, as previously mentioned, or the World Court, that is the principal judiciary organ of the UN. Then there's the International Criminal Court also, that was established by the Rome Statute. The Rome Statute is a treaty discussed within the UN. However, the ICC is an independent body from the UN. So it's, it has no relationship with the UN right now, even though it's establishing a charter was discussed within the UN. From the International Criminal Courts were created ad hoc tribunals that are specific tribunals established by the Security Council. And the two most important uh, ad hoc tribunals are, are the International Criminal Tribunal, uh, Tribunal of Former Yugoslavia and the International Criminal Tribunal of Rwanda. Both these two tribunals have stopped working and uh, they were established as per the ICTR. It was established in 1994 and the ICTY was established in 1993 both, both have stopped working, respectively, in 2005 and 2017, and they were created. And then there was a mechanism, a residual mechanism, created to finalize the work that the ICTY and the ICTR is has not finished. Um, I have in front of me here a brochure that explains more about the international residual mechanism for criminal tribunal uh, and the functions that are still carried out by this mechanism are basically tracking and prosecuting the remaining fugitive, fugitives, reviewing proceedings and retrials, it, it tries for contempt and false testimony, it supervises the enforcement of sentences and assists uh, national um, tribunals for the ICTY and the ICTR. Uh, now, a lot of people are saying that the destiny of the STL, the Special Tribunal of Lebanon, will be also in uh, the uh, uh, residual mechanism tribunal, but this is not sure because the MICT itself has a limited, um, has a limited uh, time of life. Uh, so it does not, it is not a, it is not a permanent uh, court. Um, so this, these were the important types of, uh, of tribunals, international courts. And finally, there are the hybrid courts. Uh, the hybrid courts, as the name uh, says, they are courts of mixed jurisdiction. Uh, they englobe national and international aspects of law, and they operate within the jurisdiction within the jurisdiction where the crime occurred, such as the STL, the Special Tribunal of Lebanon, the ECCC, which is the extra chambers in the court of Cambodia. So now we're understanding a little bit that the STL is a hybrid court. It operates 
uh, within the national jurisdiction of the law. Then now we're going to move to the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. What makes the Special Tribunal a unique tribunal and why is it so important in the international law at the moment? It is a tribunal of international character, as you can all recognize. International, as I have previously mentioned, it means it operates under the authority of an international organization, which is regarding the STL, it's the UN, and it was established by an agreement between the UN and the Lebanese Republic. This tribunal only is a unique tribunal because it holds trials in absentia. And it's the only tribunal among international tribunals to do that. And it deals with terrorism as an independent crime during peaceful times. So usually terrorism is dealt with during war times, but this one deals with terrorism as an independent uh, crime in during peaceful times. It's a hybrid tribunal, as I have mentioned previously to you. It applies Lebanese criminal law as the national law, and the judges are guided by high international criminal procedure standards alongside the uh, Lebanese criminal uh, code of procedures. And then we, the jurisdiction of this, uh, of this court extends only to crimes defined by domestic law. This is what makes it unique. Even though it's a hybrid tribunal and it's supposed to apply international and national law, however, the, the, the legal aspect and the, uh, the books that this tribunal goes by relate only to the, to the domestic law of Lebanon and basically the, the criminal code of procedures and the, criminal co the Lebanese criminal, criminal code. It has jurisdiction over the criminal act of terror, which resulted in the death of the ex-prime minister and 22 others. It's also important to highlight the, from among the unique features of this court, that Lebanon contributes to 49% of the tribunal's budget. This was not the case in previous ad hoc tribunals previously mentioned, uh, the Rwanda court and the former Yugoslavia court. Lebanon contributes to its budget to 49% which is like a huge one. And the rest are basically contribution, contributions from uh, other states and other organizations. Now, finally, the jurisdiction that this uh, court operates within is only limited to the persons responsible for the attack of, the, uh, of February 14th, 2005. These, this jurisdiction may be extended to other connected attacks uh, provided that for these attack, uh, for these attacks to be related to this um, to, to this terror of, uh, to this terrorism act uh, on February the 14th, uh, have the same criminal intent, the same purpose behind the attack. They show the same modus operandi, the same way of operating and uh, committing the crime. The perpetrators are somehow related, and of course. Uh, there should be the same nature, like the, the crime should be uh, the same in the same nature. So this was what makes this uh, tribunal very unique in its constitution and operation and jurisdiction. What happened with the latest decision and the latest verdict that was pronounced not long ago by the STL regarding uh, the Ayash et al case. Those are uh, in front of you on your screens. You can see the facts uh, that created this case and made it a case uh, that should be presented to this tribunal. So there was an explosion, which is the terror attack that was commit on, uh, committed on Monday, the 14th of February, 2005. There was an explosion that was triggered by a suicide bomber in a covered truck in Beirut. And the truck was loaded with more than two tons of high-grade explosive. And the explosion resulted in killing a total of 22 people. Among these people were the former Lebanese prime minister and a former minister who was with him in the car and injuring more than 220 people. And who was accused of 
uh, this uh, terror attack. Those four names were the ones accused. And who was the one who got charged in the end? Only Salim Jamil Ayash. Uh, this person was the only one who got charged and found guilty. The other three were acquitted due to lack of evidence. And it's important to highlight another time that this tribunal prosecutes individuals, not organizations, and not states. So this guy was uh, charged with the following uh, charges. He is uh, guilty to attempt in intentional homicide of 226 persons with premeditation by using explosive materials. He is guilty of intentional homicide of 21 persons with premeditation by using explosive materials. I'm sorry, this is a 22 person, not 21. This is a mistake. He is uh, guilty of committing a terrorist act by means of an explosive device. He is guilty of the intentional homicide of Rafiq Hariri with premeditation by using explosive material. Rafiq Hariri is the Lebanese prime minister who was uh, assassinated at the time. And he is guilty of conspiring to committing a terrorist attack. So who is this person who did such cruel uh, actions? He's a Lebanese citizen. He is a Hezbollah operative, and he was part of a Hezbollah operation team, and the unit was called 121, Was it, this was the name of the unit. And Hezbollah is basically a Shia Islamist political party in Lebanon and a militant group. Its leader, who is currently Hassan Nasrallah, denounced to the tribunal, uh, denounced the tribunal uh, as a plot against the party and vowed that the accused would not be arrested under whatsoever circumstances. This was announced years ago before even the tribunal uh, charges or uh, tell, says that this person is the one who's gonna be the responsible for these uh, actions. But anyway, this is what the, uh, the uh, political party that uh, Salim uh, Jamil Ayash belongs to, and he, but his family until the moment and the Hezbollah leader consider him innocent and consider that the verdict of the STL is an unjust um, verdict. So this was basically uh, the, the, the jurisdiction of the tribunal. The tribunal had a limited jurisdiction to the terror attack that was committed on February the 14th. Uh, who were the persons uh, charged, who was acquitted, and who was charged finally. Now, what are the criticisms to this tribunal? First of all, as I have mentioned previously in the beginning, that is the first international tribunal that uh, tries in absentia. And the trials in absentia can work in permanent structure. But this court specifically is a special court, which is not permanent. It was mandated for three years. It was created and established in 2009 for three years. But obviously it got extended because the verdict was announced like two weeks ago. Um, so when the trial is an abstentia, what if Ayash is arrested in the far future when the tribunal will no longer be operational? what will make of this verdict. And secondly, as I have previously mentioned, that the Lebanese government contributes to this uh, tribunal to 49% of its financing and its budget, so, which is until the moment from 2009, until the moment more than 400 million USD. So is it worth to have this trial in absentia and not have closures in the end? And what is closure after all? Is it just announcing the verdict or really uh, uh, applying the sentence to uh, the accused? And the third and most important uh, criticism to this court that was, uh, that was pronounced by Judge Robert Roth, who was a judge in the tribunal but resigned uh, on September 20, uh, 2013, 
uh, he said that this tribunal has a narrow mandate, a narrow mandate when it comes to the jurisdiction over one particular uh, one particular uh, terror attack. He he literally said, "How can a court that is both a UN and Lebanese backed court be justified for one political assassination when the Lebanese civil war lasted from 1975 until 1990?" and ended with the general amnesty despite all the war crimes and innumerable massacres that left some 200,000 people dead. So this is one of the most important criticisms to this this tribunal. However, in here and with the announcement of this verdict, there's a golden chance for the Lebanese to unite if the accused, if the accused would be handed over to the authorities to serve his sentence, that will be uh, announced in a couple of weeks. The sentence has not been announced yet. However, we know that uh, Hezbollah has announced that they won't deliver and won't hand uh, this person to the authorities. But anyway, this is this is a the chance that the Lebanese have at the moment. So this was, uh, in general, the uh, tribunal of Lebanon, what it did and what are the criticisms to this tribunal. And moving from this, we're going to go to the uh, topic that most of you are, uh, we're basically asking about in uh, the registration form, which is the Beirut blasts that occurred on the 4th of August. Uh, I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about what happened uh, on that day and what was the cause of this uh, this, tri- this uh, explosion. Uh, this blast uh, was uh, blamed to the detonation of 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate that were stored in a warehouse at the port of Beirut next to the grain silos you can see in the screen right in front of you. Um, this, uh, this ammonium nitrate, what is ammonium nitrate? They are basically uh, used, chemi- they, they are chemicals used for agriculture and uh, combined with fuel oils, they are, um, they are created, uh, they create an explosive that is basically used for constructions and mining and so on. And it has been uh, noted that throughout the years, militants have used this uh, specific chemical uh, to create bombs. And the amount of the chemicals arrived at the uh, port of Beirut um, on a Moldovian ship uh, that was named MV Roses. It docked in Beirut in 2013 and was there uh, and was unstocked and the ammonium nitrate was basically stocked in the warehouse number 12 at the air, at the port of Beirut and was stocked unsafely till the moment. So it stayed there for six to seven years. Um, what made these uh, chemicals explode was a, a fire that was triggered uh, near the warehouse and it caused the explosion that was started basically the fire start was started by welding work that was happening on the warehouse so this was basically the cause the damages it created were innumerable this is a picture that was taken from bbc that shows a little bit marfa means the port in the middle shows the grain silos uh, that where uh, the the explosion happened, and the warehouse storing the ammonium nitrate. The blast has caused uh, extensive damages uh, to the capital. Uh, the capital of Lebanon, Beirut, is home to around two million people, and around three hundred thousand people were left homeless, uh, and the losses. Uh, that you can see basically in front of you were estimated to be around 10 to 15 billion dollars. The explosion, the explosion's shockwave blew out windows uh, around Beirut and even though it, they blew out the windows at the Beirut International Port, uh, Airport, I'm sorry. 
which is like nine kilometers away from the site of the explosion. Um, so this, these were basically the damages. Around uh, more than 40 uh, people are still missing until the moment. 200 people were killed. And the, among them were firefighters who were present at the scene and also civilians and many, many, um, uh, many uh, buildings around the area were severely damaged. Um, so the victims, as I previously told you, were uh, to around 200 people killed. And uh, among them were a German foreign minister who was in her home uh, in Beirut. And to this, um, there's a huge blame from the, the people of Lebanon, the nationalists, the Lebanese people are blaming the government for their, uh, for their um, unprofessionalism and for the, the lack of uh, misman the, the mismanagement of such a case, uh, that such an important case that led to uh, an international um, an international uh, interference from all around the world. Um, after this explosion, the government resigned, and um, basically everyone in the government was blamed. But still, to the moment, no one has taken responsibility to what happened. The director general of Lebanese customs said, with uh, along with the director general of the Beirut port, said that they sent warnings about the danger uh, that was present uh, and the danger caused by these uh, by these uh, chemicals, but they were ignored. They said that they were ignored. So who is to blame at this point? Um, the current situation in Beirut is um, is relatively, uh, when it comes to a sensual, uh, sensational um, point of view, people are scared. People are still scared. People are still not feeling comfortable. They are. Everyone is lost, especially with the economic situation in the country right now. Uh, uh, some people, as I have mentioned, lost their homes, lost their uh, jobs, not only because of the economic situation, but also because their their uh, their jobs, uh, the the places where they used to work, got uh, damaged. Uh, so, going from this, the, the government till the moment has. Uh, arrested um, some some uh, people who are considered as responsible, which among them are the uh, director of the port and the general director of the Cust uh, Lebanese customs. They put them under arrest pending uh, the completion of the investigation. An international investigation is requested from a lot of people in Lebanon, but a lot of people as well are asking for local uh, local uh, investigations and local local prosecutions, um, and one of the people who is the main uh, pioneer of the uh, belief in the local uh, system is the president of the republic, uh, and he himself rejected the possibility of any international investigation, uh, and he refused the idea that this explosion could be uh, caused by external interferences, such as a rocket or a bomb or so on. Uh, till the moment, uh, there are no clear uh, answers and no uh, clear reasons to why they were stored there, how were they stored, why were they left such for such a long time. One important uh, fact was that a general that used to work at the port of Beirut uh, sent warnings to other uh, officials saying that this, these chemicals are very dangerous and they are, and he highlighted basically the, um, the, uh, the danger they create if something happens, if a fire gets erupted near them but he was assassinated and the, his family is just making sense of everything right now. Um, and this is very sad. 
so basically, this was uh, everything regarding the situation in Lebanon. This is the last image, I think, that shows uh, the crater that was created uh, because of the uh, explosion. And it's important to highlight as well that the grain, si the, the grain silos uh, prevented a greater uh, damage to uh, and prevented a greater uh, propagation of the uh, wave, the shock wave of the, um, the explosion. Anyway, they are right now, they are, as we can see, uh, destroyed. And uh, we have also this is the this is the last picture I'm going to show you for tonight, uh, the Beirut port before the fourth of August and after the fourth of August. This is the last picture I think <laughs> I thought it was previously the last and this is the last um, quote I want to end this day with. Uh, I want to end this presentation with, uh, which is by Mahatma Gandhi. There's a higher court than courts of justice and that is the court of conscience it supersedes all other courts thank you everyone for listening i'm sorry i took uh, so much time and uh, i hope the information was very beneficial to everyone here thank you thank you ma'am for enlightening us with your knowledge we hope the participants have gained knowledge on this topic a good knowledge of, about this topic. Thank so you. we have received many questions from the participant. I right. would like you to set forth to it. Okay. So the first question is, what is the main reason for the establishment of the international tribunals? The main reason for the establishment of the international tribunals. Okay, so, uh, so there are no one reason for the establishment of the international tribunals. For example, the ICC, which is the International Criminal Court, prosecutes individuals who are perpetrators of genocides, crimes against humanity, war crimes, aggression, but all the crimes that were committed after the 1st of, uh, 1st of July 2002, after its creation, I mean. So this is regarding the ICC. Now, regarding the ad hoc tribunals, the uh, special tribunals, they hold also individuals accountable for committing crimes that their own country neither have the means or the laws in place to prosecute them. And then there's the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, which settles disputes among states in accordance with international law. And it gives also advisory opinions to UN organs and other countries or so on. Um, after being referred by, to it by the Security Council of the UN, of course. So that's it. There's basically no main reason for the establishment of the international tribunals. Each tribunal has its own reason. Thank you, ma'am. So there is another question here. So it says, can international tribunals solve the political problems that is going places in Middle East countries? Okay. Uh, even though they are, they are called international tribunals, as previously mentioned, they have limited jurisdictions. So they do not have, some tribunals do not have jurisdiction over the Middle East, the region of Middle East itself, but they have jurisdiction to a country. And in the Middle East, there are no other uh, international tribunals but the Lebanese, um, but the Lebanese uh, tribunal. And even though there's international, the ICJ and the ICC, uh, the the part the states that are not party to their creating charter cannot uh, get, like cannot bring in front of this uh, court any uh, conflict uh, resolution or dispute and so on. Now, international tribunals will not be able to solve political problems in the Middle East. And for example, the the STL is a tribunal of evidence and facts. The STL, which is the special tribunal of Lebanon, yeah. uh, their verdict was a technical uh, decision. What happens in politics always happens behind the curtains. We will never be able to understand what happens exactly, politically speaking, because not all the facts are will be visible, especially that a lot of groups have interests and hidden interests. And in the Middle East, they have religious interests, uh, which makes it a little bit hard. So, yeah. But as I mentioned previously, uh, regarding uh, the political problem currently in Lebanon, 
Lebanon has a huge chance to um, to create peace right now, but there is no co cooperation. That's it. Okay, thank you, ma'am. So there is another question. What steps should the tribunals do to achieve the goal to bring peace and stability in the region? Okay. Uh, so it is not the tribunal's responsibility to bring peace and stability in any region, region whatsoever. The tribunal's purposes are strictly limited to a court's work, you know. So when the decisions made by the tribunals are based on justice, equity, equality, transparency, stability and peace will be restored automatically to the parties in, in conflict. However, international organizations are the organism that responded to the need for maintaining international peace uh, and security, whether in the Middle East or outside of the, of the Middle East. And this is due to the pressing demand for cooperation in the economic, social, and technical fields. And in their turn, these international organizations, as we know, could be NGOs, non-governmental or yeah. governmental organizations. So that's it. Thank you. So uh, another question is, there is a common principle for institution instituting international tribunals. Is there any common principles? Is there any common principle? Um, yeah. Okay, I'm going to go from general to specific by answering this question. Uh, the creation of the Special Tribunal of Lebanon was uh, a pressing need for international transparency and efficient, investi and efficient investigation uh, because of the um, lack of trust in the local uh, juridical system. Something, another example is the ICTR, which is the International Criminal Tribunal of Rwanda. This tribunal was created to prosecute the uh, responsible for the Rwandan genocide that happened in 1994. And another example is the ICTY for the Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia. It, pro it was created to prosecute individuals of the, of the atrocities that were, ha were happening uh, back then. So um, going back to your question, which was, is there a common principle for instituting uh, international tribunals? There's no, no common principle. Uh, there's, that's it. There's no common principle. Okay. So the last question is, whether international tribunal is a boon or cause? Or? Cause. cause. Okay, okay. Uh, so the international tribunals are both, just like everything. Uh, we can't say that they are a boon or they are a curse. For example, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, despite how important it is, it has so many criticisms. It is, it is criticized to have slow proceedings, to have weak management, uh, to be politically and regionally biased, even in the ICC is criticized to be biased. And it's also criticized to fail, to failing to achieve convictions in some of its most highly uh, profiled cases. So the international tribunals are a curse when they are slow, and people lose momentum. I mean, look at the STL's verdict. It was announced 15 years later after the um, after the uh, the assassination. It, that is uh, that the tribunal is looking into it, and it's a boom when a country fails itself to prosecute uh, or or solve any issue that is it is uh, it is uh, dealing with uh, due to corruption or any other uh, reason. So that's it. Thank you, ma'am, for such a wonderful session. We are very glad that we have had us with had we were with us today. I so and I also have cooperated with you as well. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. I would also like to thank all the participants for joining us. And you can find the re recorded version of this session in the YouTube uh, in our YouTube channel. And make sure you have filled up the feedback form. Uh, for getting the certificate. It's going to be given in the chat box. Make sure you fill, fill that up. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Nishad. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye.